what's it called? Doing a seminar session tomorrow with Tulo Ed out in Henderson area. So it'll be interesting. It'll be an in-person play, play wow. which is special engagement. Yeah. And, uh, actually, yeah. But the thing is, it's also a little bit more complicated because you have to wrangle the crowd a little bit more. People get noisy. There's hands up. You have to notice things. Can't just be behind your screen and kind of like looking at notes or anything like that. But should be interesting. Cool. But anyways, thank you all for joining. I think we wait maybe another minute or two just to yeah. have a little bit of grace. Yeah. It's a Thursday. It's a short week. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. People are working, getting things done. Yeah. yeah. Should be. Hope so. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> um, just as a reminder, if this is your first time joining, we're going to talk through our slides here. Um, if you have anything specific you want to talk about, any questions, toss them in the chat. Um, yeah, just toss them in the chat, and we will either answer them as we're going along, if that makes sense, or we can wait till the end. We'll also have a Q&A session at the end in case you want to wait to see all the things and then ask them afterwards. Happy to yeah. answer whatever questions we have. Um, but yeah. That's about it. And we still got a bunch of people joining. Cool. So we'll wait another minute or so just to let everyone join. And what are we talking about today? Well, H1 again. Sure. But it's topical. Very topical. Yeah. Very topical. Yeah. Um, we were talking about the cost of complying with H1. I yeah. Suppose, and, and more so around the construction um, layouts, sure. uh, envelope layouts. Sure. And yeah. I think the key thing that people are always worried about is, oh my God, it's going to be so expensive to comply with these things. Yeah. And I think our point here is to kind of short circuit that conversation. I think it will. Yeah. 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 Um, for sure. Um, so I suppose all of you listening on today and good afternoon, but bear with us. It'll take a little bit to get to the, the punchline as we head towards the end here, but yeah. um, there is one. And um, hopefully, hopefully you, you see our reasoning at least around it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's the th the key thing that I'd like everyone to kind of get out of this session is how to handle a conversation with a client or with um, if you are the client that is, you know, looking to build a new building and comply with the code, kind of getting away from thinking about how much more is this going to cost mm. because it seems like we had our values. Now we have new R values. Obviously, it's going to cost more. But if you start thinking about it a little bit more, kind of cleverly, um, it doesn't have to cost more. It could cost less. It really depends on what you're comparing. Absolutely. And there's also ways that we can arm ourselves to communicate uh, yeah. the benefits of what we're doing with H1 to a client. Um, and, you know, I suppose a selling tool of, of, of yeah. To play that to our clients with. Yeah. As much as we're consultants, we're also salespeople. We need to sell our clients on the idea that we have as a consultant. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Shall we get into it? We're Let's at 335. It. Might as well. Let's do it. So welcome everyone again as another quick little um, I guess, uh, you know, just kind of laying the ground rules. We're gonna be going through our presentation. If you have questions, toss them in the chat here. Do that anytime you want, if it makes sense at the time, and you know. We'll answer that, but if we're gonna, uh, we're about to answer it in like a couple slides. We might wait for it, but please feel free to put your um, your questions in. If we don't get to them during the thing, we will uh, get to them at the end. Um, but yeah, talking about H one and how it doesn't have to cost more. So I'd say just as a quick little overview, you guys have seen our our BS and BS uh, seminar sessions before. We've kind of released these a whole bunch of times, talked about them a whole bunch of times. You might have gone on the internet and looked at them, but this is basically the comparison. Um, and this is for housing specifically, because we have AS1 here and AS1 there. That's specifically related to housing and uh, buildings that are below 300 square meters. Yeah, and, um, and, I, and I might add, but then, mm. um, what we're trying to show here and the slides that we'll show here yeah. um, and examples of the R values that we're going to be looking at in mm. construction assemblies yeah. um, is, I've lost my train of thought. In there the construction go. R value as opposed to the theoretical R value? Uh, exactly. And I might add that there are 
a myriad of different construction assemblies that we could um, be looking at, but we've targeted one to provide an example. Sure. Um, and look, um, you know, what climate zone are we building in? What right. orientation is the building? Uh, where's most of the glazing? All that stuff has such an effect, and yeah. Yeah, that needs to be sort of kept in mind when we and when we work through the slides. So, yeah. yeah, and I think the key thing, just to kind of follow on from that, is the fact that these tables here before we had two zones we had basically the warm zone and the cold zone um now we have six different zones number one is for us up here in auckland number six is for you guys down in uh in central queenstown. otago yep. queenstown that kind of area um but in terms of differences like the roofs are basically the same the walls are basically the same the floors change slightly the floors change slightly. Um, the windows are not too far off. Skylights go up a little bit, but basically this new H1 kind of change really brought in higher R values and they're pretty much standard across the board. They might, you know, fiddle around with those a little bit. Yeah, and, and interest, interestingly, for argument's sake, the roof value of, uh, of an R6.6 mm. doesn't actually meet a, a cool climate um, passive house standard uh, that you're trying to achieve. Um, mm. Uh, in terms of our value, it's not enough. No. Yeah, fair. No. So, I think what they've done here is is pick a middle of the road that's yeah. going to cover most situations and end up with better energy efficiency around. So, yeah. you know, that's fine. Yeah, and I think the key thing that, like we mentioned before, is saving money. I think the key thing that you really have to message to your clients, to the other consultants that you might work with, to anyone else in the industry, is you can look at it as the R value on the schedule method went up and therefore, oh my gosh, extra cost, extra cost. But if you think a little bit smarter about it, if you use some modeling, for instance, you can kind of mess around with those R values a little bit as long as you're proving that it's better than a reference building. But what you can see here is, especially based on the different zones, you can see how much per year you'll save per square meter. So these numbers, you have 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, all these, these are per square meter values. Um, and I want to get rid of this little thing so you can see it, but it doesn't want to go away if I press escape. There we go. Do it like that. Um, the black line is for roofs. The gray line, which you can kind of almost see in there, it's pretty small. The gray line is for um, walls because the walls haven't gone up very much. They went from 1.9 to R2, um, but the windows have gone up substantially. And you can see that's where you get all of your cost savings just these are not cost savings on the build cost these are cost savings on your energy cost long term so the key messaging here is try to get your client to not worry about the upfront cost and try to steal some money from the maintenance operation costs down the road i, I think it highlights Pete, that your best bang for buck is putting good windows in and installing them correctly yeah uh, and so we've got some slides later that talks a bit about that exactly yeah that's that's really key the windows are the biggest the biggest deal here and they have gone up a lot which is a good thing because straight aluminium with clear glass with no low e coating and it's double glazed but mm, it's yep. not a very good well look, i live in a house like that <laughs> yeah. uh, and i have mold and deteriorating timber inside all of my windows inside as one um, does despite having my heat pumps on 100 percent of the time in the window so, yeah uh, fun oh. and games yep always fun cool so walls the good old uh the way we've always done it yeah so Here's, here's what we're going to work with in terms of uh, some examples to work through is a 90 mil uh, timber frame wall. So just a typical residential wall. Now this could be in bigger typologies with, uh, you know, post and beam set up and other stuff, but we're just looking at the, the wall as an envelope uh, yeah. element. So inside we've got a, a 13 mil, and that might be 10 mil, but I've modeled these with a, a 13 mil um, jib board in on the inside. Mm -hmm. We've got a timber frame. Now we're assuming here that we've only got 21% of timber making up the wall area which is very lofty expectations right so you're very optimistic there. i've been optimistic <laughs> so really guys the number here that we're, we're talking about is actually going to be a lot worse usually like 30 percent. i've seen well, really atrocious things on site okay so that means not only the wall area percentage is worse but also the r value that we we're presenting here won't even achieve the r value that they've got sure yeah so with a really good timber to wall ratio of 21 percent 
um, filled with glass wool insulation, probably like what, an R2, R2.1 or something like that. Uh, you have an underlay um, on the exterior side, I guess. Yep, so like just, a, just a building paper. Yeah. Um, so typical way we used to do it. And then of course, a, a vented cavity and a cladding on the outside. So it might be a Classic. weather board or whatever. Pretty typical. Now, these, I might just explain, just pop back for a sec, Pete, cheers. So these are calculated in accordance with ISO 6946. And in that we can actually achieve better R values than we've got here. But the H1 code says it's the construction R value. Mm -hmm. So internal air resistance values and the external air resistance values on this element mm -hmm. don't count towards the construction R value. So just to kind of reiterate what you were saying, ISO 6946 uh, is the calculation method to get R values or U values, I guess, of a wall. That's what Passive House uses. Yep. So it's like that's basically the most official way that you can possibly do it. Absolutely. And then you were talking about interior and exterior film layers. If you've done R value calculations, you know what we're talking about. If you don't, basically it's just a layer of still air that kind of just clings to the surface. Um, and it can add to your R value, but if it's outside and there's any sort of breeze, it immediately disappears. That's gone. So you don't want to include that. You just want to include your construction R value, yeah. just the materials inside yeah. the wall. So I suppose that's just a clarification. The, yeah. the code says, let's use the construction R value, and mm. that's what we've presented here. Yeah. Cool. And so basically you got an R value of 1.6. Yep. For that wall looks basically like that on the inside with yep. the gypsum board off. Now I might add that wall is beautiful in terms of that percentage of timber that we were oh, talking great. about. Yeah, honestly, um, I'd be really efficient. happy with that. Sure, but most of the sites we see around today, there's like twice as much. Usually, you see three or four studs on each side of the window. You see two or three rows of nogs. You see a yep. really chunky corner because they got almost to the spacing but didn't want to have a little pocket of insulation they just wanted to pack it in absolutely yeah. and you know there's no penetrations or anything there either that's just a nice insulator yeah. board. so that's the best it could get pretty classic um Alrighty. did it meet the code well no <laughs> let's go to the next slide because i'm going to stamp it with a fail yeah it fails <laughs> the old h1 and the new h1 because yep. the old h1 was r1.9 and r2.0 yep and it was only r1.6 but yep. A lot of times people would see, you know, R2 on the bag of insulation and say, R2 wall, good. Bingo. You think yeah. you're there. But mm. really, you know, and so the way we've always done it like that, we didn't even meet the old code, let yep. alone the new one. So yep. it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Forget about it. Um, now, <laughs> this is a weird photo, but what I wanted to show here uh, with a sit panel is just that construction. So we've got a, an internal board and an external board, and then the, the studs are still in there. Mm -hmm. So there's still a... A thermal bridge they're not as thermally efficient as the insulation sure. between the boards that um and there's different types of insulation that we can put in sure yeah um and so you do that basically the same kind of thing you have got your 13 mil gypsum board on the inside you got your camera frame glass wool osb on the outside some sort of membrane on the outside of that and then you got your cavity cladding i think you got oh why does this always just show up go away buddy <laughs> what issues man why it's covering it. Okay, there we go. get our 1.7. I guess you got a little bit of extra out of the OSB, eh? Yeah, look, you do. And I suppose, look, so there's going to be people out there saying, but hang on a minute, I've got a, a PIR um, infill in my SIP or whatever. And sure, there's different ways to go about it. Sure. But I'm just trying to make a like for like comparison in, yeah. and looking at the styles and then what the, the actual construction of that is. Are. Yeah, so using the same thing, but you're just putting a board on the outside, you get another point one of our value, but yeah, it's still... Yeah. Guess what? A fail. It's a fail. <laughs> right across the board. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're doing the proper calculations, if you're actually taking everything into account, it technically fails. So I think the point here is if someone's saying, oh my gosh, how much of a cost increase is this going to be? That's not even a conversation you can have because it already doesn't comply. Exactly. And so whatever cost it might take to just get up to code, that's cool. Yeah. But... Yeah. that's just an improvement from what was you know and there's for. look there's examples of uh people building sips in the country and they're not 90 mil thick sure they're like they're 140 or they're 200 sure. or whatever yeah. the case might be and they probably are achieving well in excess of the value of sure. power, which they is great eir inside they could yep. have polyurethane they could have all sorts but again and, we're trying to do a like for like in terms of wall thickness here so. yeah 
So yeah, and I think the other thing is that if you had a 140 wall instead of a 90 wall, you'll probably be able to put R3.6 in it, R3.4, and then you'll of be course. over that too. Yep, exactly. Um, but other options are okay. an external insula uh, externally insulated wall, which... Ab absolutely, so I suppose I just, yeah, I, I, I'm a fan of this. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I'm assuming everyone out there is familiar with this, but just talking through this briefly, we've got uh, an internal frame and... The beauty of this is that we aren't fixed into a timber frame. We can now use a light steel frame construction. You can use CLT, you can use concrete, you can use whatever. Whatever. Or have a mix of them on your building. Totally. Mm. But it doesn't affect uh, dramatically the, the R value that you achieve. Yeah. Um, so we've uh, we've then got a, a hard board, which is an OSB, could be something different, mm. could be ply. Sure. Um, we've got our membrane, then we've got insulation here. and. This wall uh, assembly with the uh, the steel battens on there um, is more for a sort of a, a, a medium rise uh, construction, a little bit more expensive to put those on. Yeah. Uh, so they could be replaced on a, a low res, uh, a low rise res building with um, you know just a standard timber slat batten, uh, provided that it's a. Um, uh, a ventilated batten. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the key here is that you're putting all the insulation on the outside of the board, on the outside of the structure, so you're getting one nice continuous um, piece of insulation. So yeah. you got your 13 mil gypsum board on the inside. You got the same 90 mil frame. Um, we have this assumption for the window to, for the timber to wall ratio. Yep, and but it doesn't that, matter at this point. Well, it, it or does to a little extent. Sure. sure. Uh, in that we. Uh, are allowed now to use the air pocket that we've created in that wall assembly mm. as adding to the R value of uh, the construction R value. Because it's a sealed pocket. It's a sealed pocket. Yeah. So it's not fantastic. It does sort of circulate around there and mm. convection can happen in there with, with that bit of space, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. And so wall cavity with no insulation inside it, you could put some acoustic insulation if you wanted to. Absolutely. Um, but then you have your 12 millimeter OSB on the outside, you have your membrane on the outside of that, 70 mils of mineral wool insulation. Um, then you have your vented cavity and cladding, and that brings you up to a nice R value of- While we're on the slide as well. Oh yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah, and you're right, it's 2.4. 2. 2. 2. Um, and hey, is that, wait, is that is that a pass? Spoiler alert, yeah, it's a pass. Let me see. <laughs> The next one there it is it's a pass yeah, love yeah, that yeah cool. but <laughs> um i suppose just on that and and this is uh for people to be aware of that yet yeah, you could put insulation in that inside wall frame sure. right yeah. but we've then got an air barrier on the outside of that and we've got mm -hmm. insulation on the outside of that again yeah so there's kind of like a 30 70 rule we only want if we do put insulation on the inside we only ever want to have about 30 percent of yeah. the insulation inside our air barrier yeah Good. It's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. Just keeping on the outside versus the inside. Um, here in Auckland, you could probably push it a little bit. I'd rather not. Two thirds and one third is bet is best, but you could probably push it to 50-50 here in Auckland. Um, but I generally would not. Uh, we got a question through. How does externally insulating affect the window sitting in the plane of the insulation? Yeah, excellent ah, question. Well, excellent question. Yeah, good question, because we got this here. That window, this is a UPDC window, um, but any other, you know, thermally broken window can can work. Um, this, the window is sitting kind of in line with that insulation. Yep. Um, it could be pushed further inwards without any problems because the whole inside of your wall is now warm. It's now within the thermal envelope because you have like a jacket on the outside. Yep. So yeah you don't have to necessarily put it right in the middle of your insulation at this point if you're using external insulation it can it works like that but you could put it even farther behind yeah. because and, the inside is and i think part, the, part of the question there was how do you mount it there sure um how do you well uh I'm glad you <laughs> yeah um, so there are um metal standoff brackets that uh, sort of twist into uh, an external slot in that window frame uh, and they protrude onto the inside of the rough opening yeah. uh, and that just gets screwed off yeah. uh, and then from a gravity perspective you need to support the underside of that window and there's a couple of ways you can do that in this particular build up we actually used uh, techniform clips mm -hmm. uh, which are a, a nice insulated uh, bracket that have a really good capacity for that uh, window weight yeah so they sit generally in this zone here yep. and they support the gravity load of the window and they also hold the batten exactly um which is pretty cool and then the strips that you were talking about they kind of attach into the side of the window and extend inwards so that you can put a screw into yep. the trim exactly into the, into, the, into the rough opening yeah yeah and then of course you you pack and dress with your, your um, internal materials yeah yeah 
this one was cool because it has uh, tapes instead of uh, sealant seals, liquid seals, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah, different ways of doing things. But yes, it passes. Um, that's with externally insulated walls. And that's generally our preference, or at least my preference. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, <laughs> look, yeah, sure. Look, there's different ways to go about it. And as yeah. we mentioned, you can increase the thickness and change the materials and have a sit panel that's perfectly adequate. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, uh, but I, I think going this way with externally insulated, mm. it has some other benefits that um, when you, you look at the whole of building, um, really come into play. Oh, so got them here. Look at that go. Uh, yeah, like you close your thermal bridges. So like if you have the insulation on the outside, um, especially if you have like a timber wall here, a concrete column, a steel column, some beam over there, basically this insulation goes on the exterior side of all of that. So all of that stays on the warm side. It doesn't thermally cycle getting bigger and smaller. It doesn't creak around or anything like that. Um, so yeah, you close your thermal bridges, especially the slab edges, for instance, it can be easier to install on site. Some installers will agree with you. Some will very much disagree yeah, here I, in New Zealand. I, I think that's a matter of practice and it experience is. with people, right? It really um, is. Yeah. If there are Canadians or Europeans on the, the construction crew, they'll be like, oh my gosh, external insulation. I love that. I did that so much. Yeah. Whereas. Yeah. And, and look, you've got a, a clean slate to install the insulation on the yeah. outside of the building, right? It's like you butt your, yep. your, your bats together and yep. away you go and you, you pin them onto the wall. Yep. You're not having to cut around all the nogs mm -hmm. and the studs and mm -hmm. everything on the inside. Mm -hmm. It's an efficient way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when you have complicated like securement structural details, you're not going in and insulating all around all this and that and putting membranes, it's just, it's all done. Um, yeah, one uniform la use insulation layer on the building, no risk for inter interstitial condensation, as long as you put enough insulation. And, and as long as you don't do the two third, one third thing, and you don't violate you've got that. some pretty good air tightness. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so you build it right. If you do it properly, then there's no <laughs> expert internal <laughs> incantation. Yeah. Um, but also, you improve your acoustics and fire rating. If you're using something like a mineral wool, a rock wool, it's fairly dense and heavy, so it absorbs a lot of sound, especially like um, low frequency sounds. It absorbs a lot of that. Yeah. Um, so you're putting basically soundproofing and fireproofing on the outside of your wall in addition to it also working as thermal components. Yeah, and so the slide that we showed before with the, the picture of that uh, wall build-up, um, that, that has non-combustible materials on it. Yeah. Um, although that cladding might be timber, so that might burn. Yeah. But, you know, you could exchange that out for, you know, a fibre cement sheet sure. or whatever it is that you Aluminium want. Aluminium cladding. Yep. Or um, and so then you, you've you've got that capacity to, uh, to be on a fire boundary or yeah. you know, whatever. And, like, I think everyone's used to using rock wool in um fire breaks or um to wrap around uh let's say a, a chimney that goes through a wall or something like that sure. um so it gives you that like, extra fire rating but anyways let's move on to floors cool uh so slabs on ground and again this is the the good old way we used to do it pretty typical yeah yeah um raft slab sure perimeter beam deep sure. into the ground where we go yeah form it up pour our concrete uh we've got our rear in there yep. um whatever starter sort of scenario if it's a if it's a larger building or you know you might just um shoot through your um your bottom plate onto the onto the slab yep uh, but there we are that's that's a typical build up right straight up um does it pass it not does really not <laughs> now this is a classic example where yeah. the the um the construction r value is different from when you might allow for some of those surfaces instances mm -hmm. that that um that the passive house uh, sort of standard of, of the way we calculate might allow for mm. But it still doesn't pass. Uh, we're, we're miles out of it. Yeah, and especially if you go farther south, the ground temperature is much colder. Up here in Auckland, it's like 16-ish degrees, whereas down there, it's probably, what, 10, 5, uh, 4? Yeah, depends uh, on the season. changes, changes. Like, um, yeah. So the ground actually freezes down there. Sure. Um, and to the point where you know, construction becomes difficult. You, yeah. you bring a digger in and you actually pull a massive clump out because mm -hmm. it's ice. Um, <laughs> To me, that's that's, that's, that's that's reasonable. That's like that's what happens in Canada. Yeah, like no, that's no, right no, no, from no, no, yeah. No, we're not here. It's we don't need that. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, it, it doesn't pass. It doesn't um, pass. And so, like, not even what's close. what's the cost? The extra cost of complying? Well, hang on. We didn't comply. We didn't comply. Um, <laughs> so let's start by complying. Yeah, let's do that. Um, and I'd say the easiest way is that way. Um, you could put the under slab insulation. I would definitely recommend it down in zone six, zone five, zone four. Here in Auckland, you could probably get away with it not being there unless you want nice warm slab. 
to walk on. If you, you know, want to put a, you know, uh, a in ground heating um, kind of situation up there, mm-hmm. then you probably want to insulate there just so it's not working super hard and bleeding heat into the ground. But that right there is the easiest way to improve your R value. Yeah. yeah. Now, there are your different materials there. you can put there. There's sure. some really nice high density insulative boards sure. that actually, you, they look fantastic too. Yeah. They're, they're dressed off well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So there's, there's plenty of choices out there. To, yeah. To but apply. for me, like the cheapest chips option would be get a, a strip of XPS, the blue stuff or the pink stuff, stick it to the side there have a flashing tuck underneath your cladding and come down to cover it and it's done like that's all there is to it it's very very simple it can be done after the building's basically built um like cladding is mostly on you just gotta stick it to the side there and it'll get sure this bottom plate will be nice and warm your feet will be nice and warm over there and you're just not losing a lot of uh energy also having it under here sometimes is a structural issue so you have to check with the structural um engineer or whatever but if you just close off the slab edge put a little bit underneath you're 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 gonna be doing a lot better than usual Absolutely. a lot better than the 0.14 uh that you would get typically i was gonna say it didn't fail you got the wrong way yeah, right. yeah no, this one fast look at it go. go and look we just sneak in with uh climate zone six there with a construction R value of 1.7 yeah but hey it's a pass and, and this is only with the 50 mil around the perimeter yep. nothing underneath nothing underneath yeah, yep. so this drawing showed it underneath, but that was just you know demonstration showing that you could do that. But yep. just with the perimeter edge insulation, you get that one point seven cheap as chips. I don't know what what XPS costs right now, but what like a couple bucks a square meter? Uh, is that even too much? I seriously don't know. I don't either. But, it, I don't yeah. either. <laughs> um, but yeah, not very expensive, and you could either have it pre-finished, like you said, um, yep. or just cover it with your metal flash exactly. that you're probably going to use anyway. Okay, team. So here we are going to get into somewhere where we're going to, yeah, this is a bit different. Sure. Let's just say that. Sure. So a traditional roof, because this is a cold roof. And what do we have with a cold roof? We've uh, maybe got tiles on the roof. Uh, the examples that we've got here is we've got a metal uh, roof. Um, and then we're putting some insulation on top of the ceiling uh, inside that cavity. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the caveat is... Uh, I said, oh, yeah, like that. Oculus does not recommend that we build this way. Yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of other problems, and we can talk about that until the cows come home. Yeah. But uh, for the purpose of this is the way we've always done it, yeah. um, this is the way we're looking at this. Yeah. Generally how you do it. Pretty typical. Everyone's seen these before. Um, I also like when there's this kind of slope on a roof as opposed to trying to put that assembly with, like, a three-degree roof. Yeah, no, it's just... It's <laughs> mm, asking for trouble, but outside the purposes of this conversation, we're talking about H one. Um, so this used to used to pass, um, but now it fails uh, because you need R six point six if you're using the schedule method. Yeah. Um, but if you want to pass with that schedule method, you could just toss more insulation. Exactly right. Um, and so yeah, basically you're putting almost three hundred millimeters of glass wool. It looks a little bit more like. Oh, there so you have it between your your roof joists over there and then you're just putting another layer on top yep. which is better because you're closing up those thermal bridges um but it still has the problems the interstitial condensation. yeah yeah problem. like i said that's that's a, another topic uh, we, we don't recommend you build this we way we do not recommend this by the way <laughs> but this is the way we always used to do it right? yeah. we used to build houses like this yeah so construction r value 6.9 6.9 does that, does that pass come on man yeah it does. oh come on there we go. 6.6. 6, past. past. Okay. Okay. But now, hang on. We've added all this extra insulation. Mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. Surely that's got to cost more. Mm-hmm. Well, um, it's around about, and the next slide is, is a bit more detailed. Mm-hmm. So you're adding that extra almost 200 mils of insulation. Yep. Costs an extra about yep. $10.74. $10.74 yep. straight from Bunnings. So that's mm-hmm. retail to, you know, Punter Joe that wants to improve his insulation in his house. Yep. Not even like a group home builder that gets like a discount because absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh 10 bucks 74. Now I don't have to bore you with all the calculations here, mm-hmm. but what we're saying is that for your extra ten dollars seventy four a square meter that you've got to put in, you get an extra three point three. Yeah. R value. Yeah. 
and um, this multiply, is this multiply. is the calculations for Queenstown. So you know, so it looks well, better because of Queenstown. Of course it does. Yeah, of sure. course it does. <laughs> um, but but there's an offset, and we'll talk about that in a minute for sure. for Auckland. Sure. Um, but if we use thirty cents as a typical um, per kilowatt hour cost of your electricity, mm -hmm. you were saving six dollars seventy three per square meter per year. Mm -hmm by having that extra insulation in your house. Now, mm -hmm. this is on a 150 square meter standard dwelling. Yeah. You're saving a thousand and nine bucks. Per month, per, per year, year, per year, sorry. Per year, per month would be awesome, right? Yeah. But we're saving that much per year. So I think just next slide. Please. Well, what that means is you get a payback period of- 1.6 years. Yeah. Right. So you spend that extra little bit of money, but it comes back to you, come on, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the summary, right? Yeah. So you spend an extra ten seventy four. It takes no time at all to install that. And sure, this these calculations are a little bit simplified. Mm -hmm. We're not looking at uh, the interest uh, payment or whatever the interest rate is on the the person buying the house and sure. paying for that mortgage. Sure. Again, we're not actually looking at the increase in the electrical costs over time, which traditionally go up uh, double every ten years. Mm -hmm. So. We're expecting to see that come up. So the the payback in 1.6 years is pretty realistic. Yeah, I'd say um, definitely realistic. And this is purposely very simplified, just to kind of give you the ammunition, so that when you're talking to a client, you can be like, yes, it is going to be an extra ten dollars a square meter for this extra roof insulation, but it pays itself back in this amount of time. Exactly. It gives you the extra comfort. You don't yeah. spend as much on electricity, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. But it doesn't fix the condensation risk. No, no. And that, and that's the issue with a cold roof, right? Yeah. No, we don't recommend cold roofs, yeah. um, warm roofs. Now with warm roofs, there are a whole bunch of different, um, options. I suppose, challenges and options. Oh, okay, sure. Um, you know, so how do we how do we support the the skin that's on top of the roof? And so there's there's all sorts of more commercial and industrial style sort of setups uh, sure. um, that, that will change uh, the way that looks. Yeah, um, yeah. But the key thing is if you're going with a warm roof, um, we got some a little bit more proper roofs. So these are proper condensation controlled cold roofs. So these are very similar to. Oh, we're gonna do that again. Similar to something <laughs> like this. It's a cold roof. But the key thing, and if you were at our last webinar, you'll see that we have our gypsum board layer down there. I'll zoom in a little bit. Our gypsum board layer down there, we have a service cavity, and then we have a vapor control membrane, that green thing. Um, you got your insulation inside there. This is a skillion roof, so I'll move over to this one. So that's more similar to the picture I was showing you. We have our ceiling, we have our service cavity, we have a vapor control membrane, we have a whole bunch of insulation in there. Then we have a sealed underlay, we have space between the underlay and the metal, and then that space drains out to the edge. So this is a properly done cold roof, which obviously because there's more things involved, it will probably be more expensive than yeah, the than traditional the old roof, yeah, yeah. obviously. But if you want to do it properly and you want to make sure there's no condensation in your roof space long term for the lifetime of the building, this is the way that you do a cold roof. But it might be, ooh, we went to the next slide. Why are we doing this? What are we doing? Oh gosh, all over the place, <laughs> all over the place. Here we go. So if you want to do it a little bit more efficiently, instead of having to use almost 300 millimeters of fluffy insulation in your ceiling space, you could put all of the insulation on the outside of your structure, make it into PIR, phenolic foam, something like that, and encapsulate it in your, uh, your membrane roof. This could end up being cheaper than the cold roof with that much extra insulation having to frame around it and, and allow that space. And then also if you're comparing it against a proper cold roof, oh my gosh, again, proper cold roof with all of the extra bits and bobs, it might end up being cheaper. Yeah, there's a lot of extra labor in that. Oh my gosh, why? Why won't you just do the yeah, thing that I want trouble, you to do? Apparently, yeah. oh my gosh, <laughs> really? Okay, yeah, that one. Just because there's less um, bits and bobs involved, you get your board on, you get your vapor barrier down, you're weather tight now, and then you can put on the rest of the roof whenever you want. So it's just, there's different different benefits. Um, and it, it's the key thing is having the conversation going to all the benefits as opposed to how much extra is this going to cost? Because it's not really as simple as that. Um, yeah, benefits of a warm roof. Closes your thermal bridge is the same thing as having your external insulation can be easier to install on can site, yep. depends on your layout, depends on how everything works, et cetera, et cetera, obviously. 
but it makes one uniform insulation layer around the whole building, which can connect to your external insulation. I was just about to mention that. Which Excellent. works really, really well. Um, you delete the risk for interstitial condensation, if it's done right, if you have enough insulation, if you keep the air yep. pockets closed, yeah, yeah. things like that. Um, and then it'll probably improve the acoustics. It may uh, improve the fire rating if you're using rock wool. If you're using foam, probably doesn't give you much uh, fire rating or acoustic rating. Um, but maybe a little bit. Yeah, maybe I, think, I think there's a little bit of a stigma around, say, PIR, but I don't think it's as bad as um, some people might think it is. And there's PIRs aren't PIRs just as oils and oils. Correct. So uh, I, I think another message here is that all these different roof styles, and, and obviously this is a pretty important topic of H1 where we could get by before with not so much insulation. We, yeah. we actually do have to add more. Mm -hmm. But do we? In Auckland, mm -hmm. we probably don't have to add all that much more. R6.6 I'm, I'm going to say this, it might sound a little bit controversial, but R6.6 is too high for Auckland. You don't need that much, especially if it's like the top floor of an apartment building. Is it really going to do that much? R6.6, yeah. you could probably still get the same effect out of R3.3. So how do we go about figuring that out? How do we go, get about do, go about doing that? Uh, is that on the next slide? No, it's not. Um, but basically, it comes down to not using the schedule method, using modeling method to make sure you're not going to have overheating, check all the different things. You could do calculation method as well. Gives you a little bit less flexibility, and it gives you a little bit less surety on how, you know, how much energy you're going to use long term. Exactly. But... Modeling works. So I, th I think that's a, a judgment call for you guys to make yourselves. When you, mm -hmm. you're doing a design, do you want to go to the modeling method uh, if the scale of the building is large enough where, yeah. you know, paying a, a consultant's fee to do that modeling for you and optimize that build up? Yeah. Um, is that going to be offset with the savings that you're going to get from going from a 6.6 .6 down to a, a 4 or a whatever that R value might be for that particular run? Uh, Plus the amount building. of money you save in the long run for making sure that everything's properly insulated um, with that modeling um, could also help. But yeah, I think the other key thing that I was trying to say um, is just think a little bit outside the box. We have mentioned these in previous, um, previous webinars, but it could be less expensive to use a membrane warm roof than it is to do a proper cold roof or even just an R6.6 .6 cold roof the wrong way. Mm -hmm. This could end up being cheaper depending on your building methodology. And look, these are just examples we've got here. Yeah, there are other uh, people out there with other systems that sure. are being offered and sure. and that are being developed. And and so so we've obviously got a little bit of insight into the fact that there are other uh, mm -hmm. suppliers working on other solutions that are going to meet the uh, the new H one code and be cost effective. I think exactly right. that's what they're all looking for. But anyways, let's get, get well. Let's get to Windows. Let's talk about Windows. Um, this is something that we had on one of our previous slides from one of our previous webinars. But you can kind of just see the difference in performance um, from a traditional cold frame, aluminium, no thermal break, um, hanging way outside on a WANS bar. Um, you can see how cold everything is over here. It's all nice and blue, whereas you put a thermal break in there, all of a sudden you start to get a little bit of green over here. It starts mm -hmm. to get a little bit warmer. Then you take your thermally broken, you push it inwards, get it off that WENS bar, put it more in line with the insulation like um, we were speaking about before. And that really kind of warms things up. You still have a cold side of your window frame, but that's outside of the thermal break. Uh, and, and there are ways to change that. You can bring your insulation actually around the front of your window frame and press sure. that off depending on your flashing system. Yep. Uh, and that'll improve that installation detail significantly. Yeah. And then the last one is a UPVC frame. Um, just gets you a, a lot more warmth because the whole thing is a thermal break. It's basically made out of thermal break, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of pricing, a lot of people always ask about this. They ask about thermally broken frames, ask about non-thermally broken frames. Right now in Auckland, until, when is it, November, the windows go up to the um, R0.46. Right now they're at 0 0.37. Um, right now you can technically comply with a cold window with argon fill and low E coating um, based on that table E1.1.1 in there. Um, uh, now, you, you comply to H1, right? You comply to H1. You, you don't comply to E3. 
you don't comply to E3, Sorry. but they're not completely tied together. So yeah, it's on I you it. to do the right it. thing. Yeah. Um, so like that's that's why I do not sign off on cold windows. Um, because it you get condensation. You get condensation, you get mold growth, you get you know, rot in your uh, in your materials on the inside, and you only see part of it. The the moisture works its way down into mm. the wall, and yeah. there's a lot of damage being done that it just goes hidden for ages. Right? Exactly. And it really only starts to visibly, noticeably show up after like five years that's when it's too late 10 years yeah when <laughs> yeah. it's already rotten on the inside of the wall yeah and it's like you know really not doing so well so yeah, exactly. yeah uh thermally broken upvc do you see upvc windows becoming the standard here in new zealand no i don't personally do you uh, i wouldn't say it's a standard but i think it's a good material and yeah uh, and it's a good offering i think you... right now i think they're about the same price thermally broken aluminium versus upvc depends on who you're getting them from depends sure. on the size of them etc cetera, etc cetera. um but ubc generally has a lot higher performance than the equivalent cheap thermally broken frame here in new zealand yeah. um they are the standard for single family homes in north america canada and the us are all upbc um, because it's the cheapest because there are a bunch of manufacturers and suppliers and installers of specifically pvc windows um here I feel like right now the industry is so aluminium heavy and even the people buying the windows have this stigma against UPVC. I don't see it becoming standard very soon, but I'll see a lot more. I think we'll see a lot more people trying to use them. I, I, look, I think it's a good product personally myself. I think it's a great product, yeah. Uh, I don't see why we wouldn't try to uh, experiment, use them, see so you go, you know, put them in some of your designs and, yeah. and get some feedback. You know? Yeah, and I think the other key thing when you're trying to convince your client is have a sample um, and and show them. Do you see Return to Timber Ooh. Windows? I I would love to. <laughs> yeah. They cost money. They cost a lot of money. It's not just money. It's maintenance as well. Sure, true. You know? yeah. um, and so, you know, you can get some beautiful passive house standard or even close to passive house standard yeah. timber windows yeah. um, with an external sort of clip-on aluminium yep. finish. Yep. Um, but bang for buck, there's no comparison between what you get from a UPVC versus going to a high quality window. Yeah, because uh, like timber, timber, timber might be window. might be twice the price of a UPVC, oh, yeah. and it has about the same thermal performance, and it looks a lot better. And hey, if, it, if that's your preference in your house, by all means, fill your boots. Sure. Definitely put them in. And you, know, you can get you can get a pine um, sure. timber frame, which is more cost efficient, I suppose, if you sure. really want to go that way. Sure. But, you, know, you go to a premium oak, um, you're paying a hell of a lot more for the frames. Yeah, so. and I think the key thing with the UPVC, um, and if like if anyone online wants to come into our shop and come take a look, we have some samples and things like that. You, the you joinery quality. Well, well, first of all, yeah, you don't you, know. You can't tell it's UPVC. Yeah. By looking at it, you think, oh, it's it's a powder coated aluminium. It's very classy yeah. looking. But I think the hardware of it is the key selling point for me. It really locks in. Um, it has gaskets and things like that that seal much tighter um yeah good question christine why would we move to more plastic well very good very good point the um now i'm not an expert here but i understand that the upbc that they're using uh the wastage is very minimal and what they do they can actually recycle yeah but i think the the life cycle analysis on it isn't all that bad yeah like it, it depends on where you put the boundaries of the box um but upvc versus aluminium they're not too far away from each other and it depends on where you're doing it here in new zealand we have a lot of aluminium recycling whereas with the upvc i think we have to ship it offshore to get it recycled if i'm not mistaken so i think if more people are using upvc it'll become much more cost effective to have a recycling plant here um, and it'll become more cost effective because there's going to be more manufacturers and suppliers of it so it all kind of it's hard to tell. It's hard to forecast that, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. But yeah, more plastic at our buildings. Yeah, it's not great, but it can be recycled. It lasts a lot long time. It's not like you're you're replacing it all the time. So, yeah, something to think about. But um, you know, I guess we'll see how it goes. But just as a reminder, this is another thing. Once again, we're reiterating the windows. Yeah, windows are key. Um, and this graph only shows the different R values 
specifically our values. It doesn't take into account durability. It doesn't take into account air tightness because air carries a lot of energy. So if you have a really loose window that lets a lot of drafts through, you'll have a lot of wastage and you won't get, um, you either won't get as much as this or with an airtight window, you'll get more. Um, but yeah, air tightness is another key thing. Um, but yeah, it's really just the fact that the windows are so poor that any increase to that window will yeah, substantially yeah. help you. And, and I think it, reiterating here as well, Pete, mm. it's not just the quality of the window and you want a good, you want a good window with a good frame, mm. but it's how it gets installed into the building. Mm. And please pay particular attention to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Recess details, um, push them in a little bit, uh, make sure that they work properly. Um, how does timber weigh up for life cycle analysis? Timber's probably a little bit better. I don't think I've actually looked at that. Uh, look, it is good. Yeah. It is good. Mm -hmm. um, I think just on that point, though, is that, you know, some proponents out there will say the more timber we put into a, a building, mm -hmm. the more carbon we've got sequestered, and that's a great thing. Sure. But we're using more timber sure so and I, also i think we need to weigh that up yeah like that's the other thing like i've been on these webinars where um like different manufacturers some do aluminium some do timber some do this some do that and so the aluminium ones will have a very bad way of counting the timber because you have monocropping <laughs> um uh, like radiata pine huge huge swaths of that monocropping it is not very good for the environment um, and takes a lot to remediate and we should be using more na native timbers and more diversity, et cetera, et cetera. So there's so many different things to weigh and I don't think anyone really has a solid answer. Um, and I think the key is using different materials. Um, if we all switch to only timber all the time, we won't have enough timber. If we switch to all aluminum all the time, we won't have enough aluminum. If we switch to all this, all that, yeah. I think there's some healthy competition out there. Exactly. And, and that's good for auctions. Right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, other ways to save costs with the windows, um, delete the WANs bar because you're going to do that anyways to pull your window in and recess it a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then the next question is, how do we seal the edges? Yeah. How do we fix that? So look, there's, uh, for argument's sake, uh, a product from Proclima, uh, Com Contigo? Contigo. Contigo. Yeah. So it's got a, a it's, yeah, so it's got a tape on one edge that mm. you tape around the perimeter of the window. Mm. Uh, and then the tape on the other side tapes back to your window frame, uh, like the rough opening side. This is on the exterior side of the yeah, window. Yeah, on the okay. exterior side. Sure. And so that provides a great air tightness layer straight away. Sure. And then, of course, we can do uh, a treatment on the inside as well. Yeah. Um, and I think the other, uh, in, in terms of sealing, sorry, I was going to go with more about, oh, did I skip it already? Might have, where was that window? Uh, Where's the window? Oh, it's the external insulation. Yeah. I thought it was. Um, so the external insulation, you can see yeah. the window there. We got a big sill tray. Um, and once again, we have this sample in our shop. Um, there is a jam flashing that fits inside of this upturn here. So any water that comes down there will go onto your sill and then outwards, and then a head flashing that fits over top of the jam flashings. And so really, a lot of times I get questions from architects saying, oh, if we recess the windows, then what do we do? You have this whole open side. And really, it's just flashings. It's just yep. you have your jam flashings, you have your head flashing, you have your sill flashing. Just extend them a little bit to make them a bit yep. longer. Um, and then that treats your, your exterior opening there. Um, so there's that. Where did we go here? Taped air seal. So on the inside of that sample that I was just showing, um, that was a taped seal instead of a sealant seal. Yep which I think is good because it's, uh, you know, it just sticks on a lot quicker. You're not messing with things and trying to like tool liquidy stuff and waiting for it to cure and just yeah. like it's done. Nice and clean. Yeah. And then air tightness, like I mentioned. So you do that with your air seals, but then you also have to worry about the miter joints of your windows, the gaskets and things like that. So miter joints I've found have been pretty bad um, with the aluminium, um, especially with, um, Thermally broken aluminium um, has been a little bit difficult to deal with because they don't seal those miters very well. Yeah, exactly. Whereas the UPVC, they weld those miters. They are now one piece of plastic. They are. They heat, they heat both sides up, mm. push them together, and then they clean the outsides of them mm. up. So mm. they're, they're a welded system. Yeah. Um, there's a question in, can we purchase a flashing system from Oculus? Uh, I'd love to say yes, but no. You um, don't want to charge. <laughs> we don't, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we could show you how to do it. Yeah. Uh, give and me we, some tips. We could probably steer you in the right direction yeah, if you want to yeah. give us a, a buzz later, Kim. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'd say there's a lot of people who do 
flashing's a lot faster and a lot better than we do. Oh, absolutely. We figured it out, but yeah, we're not pros. Um, it's not what we do every day. Um, air tightness as well, not just with the exterior seals, but especially the gaskets. Like most New Zealand windows, like this, the typical big three, big four, whatever you want to call them, they squeeze shut, but it's not a very tight fit on those gaskets. The gaskets also are not welded at the edges. Um, and then in addition to that, um, especially with sliding doors, oh, yeah. all of the domestic sliding doors, I don't want to say all of them, but like 99.9% .9 of the, the domestic ones have brush gaskets. And those are just mohair brushes that slide against and kind of just like loosely fit against something. Yeah, That's where the air comes in. That's where the water comes in. And so mm -hmm. um, we can get those brush gaskets, those mohair gaskets with a plastic fin. Sure inside them and that helps dramatically with uh with the weather time so that uh, it that does yeah. um but if you're comparing it against a upvc the ones that we have in the shop here have it basically you turn this big handle and that sucks the um the door outwards to press against the gasket and then it's fully sealed yeah. you can you know put it underwater and it basically won't exactly won't anything through. exactly Align the window with the thermal layer. That kind of goes along with the deleting the lens bar. Yep. And then fewer large windows rather, rather than, than more small, small windows. windows. Yeah. yeah. Every time you put a mullion in, that's a thermal bridge. Even if it is thermally broken, even if it is UPVC, the glass is going to be better. Yeah. And again, you know, cost. Mm. It costs more. You've got more flashings. You've yep. got more tape. You've got all that time. Yeah. The, the labor cost in putting yep. windows in. Yep. We've put a few more big ones in and take some of the small ones out. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Uh, the other one that I forgot to mention there is choose fewer sizes of windows. Um, I've mentioned that a few times. Um, there's some projects that I work on where the architect has detailed 50 different window sizes, and that just costs money because they're all bespoke. Whereas if you have two or three kind of vary them around the building, it's a lot quicker to manufacture those. Yeah. Yeah. And so you save a little bit of money. That's about it. We got question and answer. People have been answering questions or asking questions already, but if you have any other ones, please feel free to put them through. We got a few other ones that came in from online beforehand. Um, so we'll answer those, but please put your questions into the, the question area right now. Um, what other alternative ways of building outside the timber framing? Uh, what are other alternative ways? Yeah, that are cost effective. So outside of just timber framing, so if you don't wanna use timber studs, that's fine. You could use LVLs, so like engineered wood. It's still timber studs. It's still timber. Basically the yeah. same thing. Um, but it, you could use a steel stud yep. as long as you're using the external insulation. Absolutely. Um, um, sips? You, oh, no, sorry, Pete. Please. You can use a sip. And so depending on the structure of that sip, you may have less timber in it. Yep. Uh, and so that's one other way. Yeah. And the sips can vary on, like we said previously, different types of insulation, different thicknesses, different... Yeah. Um, boards on the interior, exterior, whatever it might be. So they're not all the same. Um, thermal mass concrete panels. Um, we have one of those, one example of those going up in Mangare Bridge, I believe. That's our Beta Ventura one, which is a passive house, Kangora building. Um, it was precast concrete, just like tilt slabs. And as much as I don't like precast concrete, um, as an exterior surface, um, I do get the point that they're easy to just kind of like tilt up. But what we did was uh, switch them to a thermal mass concrete panel. So you have the structural panel on the inside, you have a layer of insulation, and then the external cladding concrete panel. It's all one unit, and you just tilt it up, but it has the insulation in already. So it gets you a pretty good, uh, pretty good R value and uh, uses the interior as thermal mass, which is good. Steel deck under a warm roof. Um, that's one that's kind of like less popular here. Um, usually you'll have your timber roof trusses mesh underlay steel roof mm -hmm. um but you could um use a steel deck first then put your vapor barrier put your insulation put another membrane on the outside of that um a lot of times i've seen it like you have to put a concrete slab you don't necessarily need to do that you can save money with a steel deck um plywood even usually is more expensive yep. than steel deck is that what you found uh yes it is but okay. it's still commonly used yeah, yeah, it is. People are just yeah. comfortable with it. So yeah. it is what it is. Panelization, another way to make things quick. Yeah, Easy. look, uh, there's a lot of a lot of people out there starting to get into that space. Yeah. So, yeah. Big panels that all uh, assemble. I think Simonite has one. Do you know of anyone else? Not sure. Not sure. Okay, cool. Not That's context. fine. Um, understanding the breathability of a building versus airtight. Yeah. Um, 
how, like, what yeah. do you what do you prefer? Do you prefer breathing through your mouth or through a bunch of stabs through your chest? Yeah. Well, what, what do you I, prefer? I, 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 do I have to have that choice? You don't know that's a, that's not an either or here, yeah. but like, but that's the way that I see it. It's like. What, what were you going to say? Sorry. I oh, no. Look, I, I actually was playing golf uh, last weekend with a guy in his 70s, and mm. we were talking about this particular subject. Sure. And he says, yeah, but a house has got to breathe. Mm -hmm. Again, yep. you know, the way we always used to do it, right? And I mean, technically, it's correct. Old villas were very air leaky. They had a big yep. fireplace. You had a big chimney. You have the fire running all the time. Air is blowing through there. It stays dry. Yep. They've stood the test of time. They're up for hundreds of years. Sure. But we're we're talking about energy efficiency, right? Correct. And comfort. Yeah. And so like with that villa, you can be energy efficient by just not heating it and just being a, a <laughs> shivery mess inside your house. Okay. But if you want to be comfortable. I'll try the other. I'll try okay. the other well, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, let's make it airtight. Let's make it airtight and ventilate it right. Correct. And... So like you still want to have breathability of your building, but usually that breathability is vapor permeability. So you're allowing things to dry out. Um, and then you're also having it breathe through the mechanical ventilation system Absolutely. Um, so that you can be comfortable on the inside, also very energy efficient, and it stays nice and dry and comfortable. So, I mean, yeah, make it breathe through the mouth as opposed to through stabs through the chest. You don't want to have leaks. I still don't love that analogy. That's I, fair. I, it's, I a little bit violent. it's a little bit violent. Yeah, that's, yeah, fair. Yeah. that's fair. That's okay. fair. That's fair. <laughs> but basically, yeah make it breathe the way that you want it to as opposed to infiltrating air um h1 for commercial and education buildings updates and compliance generally so what we showed i'll go back to our first slide is we showed this one this is for housing so if you go into the new a uh, h1 as2 to the same table in as2 you'll have a bunch of different um a bunch of different r values so the roofs for i think zones one, two, and three are like around three, 3.5, something like that. Um, the walls, I believe, are at R2.2 all across the board, if I'm not mistaken. Windows start at 4.46, and I think they go higher for the South Island um, and, you know, the higher numbered um, things. But basically, the compliance is the same. Basically, you can either follow that schedule method and use those numbers, or you can use calculation, or you can use modeling. Um, yeah, we just finished off our H1 summary. Uh, thanks, Angie. Uh, and uh, we will be posting that so you can have a look. And we talk about both residential and commercial. But to be honest, buildings are buildings. They work the same way. There's people inside them. Yeah. You might have different yeah. use cases because like in a house, you'd be sleeping in there and generating a lot of moisture while it's cold outside. Whereas in a commercial education building, usually People are there during the day when it's a little bit warmer when the sun's out and then they leave at night, but it's all the same stuff. Yeah. The condensation happens the same way. The physics happen the same way. Yeah. All the same stuff. But anyways, those are all the questions. These are all the uh, building science and bullshit seminars we've done so far. These two, we got some more coming up uh, later on. I think we're moving a little bit away from H1 and kind of just talking about more general building science. But if you take a picture of that QR code, you can register fairly simply. Um, and then also, if you want, you can also hop on our Instagram. It's Pink Boost. Uh, we have our LinkedIn. We have our website, which is in the process of being updated. We'll we'll get there soon. And then our next one is on, uh, oh, we didn't update this one. So our next one is next month on the 25th of May. Um, but we have one more question. Roger. Oh, sorry. We'll go ICF. Kim, ICF, insulated concrete formwork, full Canadian theme. Yeah. Hey, ICF is cool. Yep. I've seen a lot of really cool, um, like they stack together really easily yep. and I, come together I, quick. I think, again, there's horses for courses here. So mm. some are pretty good and they stay dimensionally reasonably stable yep. when you pour. Yeah. Uh, others I've seen recently, a little bit wonky and uh, it makes makes putting other stuff on around them all that much trickier. Yeah. I find that it's really good for basements below grade. You probably wouldn't want to use it above grade. It just seems inefficient. Um, I don't know. I feel like there's better, cheaper ways or more economical ways that you courses can Courses for courses. And yeah. of course, you're putting a hell of a lot of carbon in there when you're filling it with concrete. Right? Yep. So. Yep, exactly. Yep. Um, but it is good because it's warm on the inside, warm on the outside. You have two layers of EPS usually. Um, insulated concrete slabs can have very high end of life costs, which will become a consideration soon. 
Um, are you talking about the insulated concrete like tilt slabs? Um, yeah, they can have a high end of life cost, probably in and around the same as, as precast concrete as a cladding. Um, you do have the additional complication of having the insulation inside there, but it's easily chipped out. Just a little bit more extra work when you're when you're taking it all, all apart. Um, but yeah, hey, Roger, I mean, I don't like a lot of concrete for that reason. I you like concrete as structure, um, but yeah. putting it on the outside of the building to yeah. me just seems like a waste of money. Because so I think, I think that's a valid comment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very valid comment. And it's... I'd say even the 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 high end of uh, life cost is also like taking it off the building. You need to hire a big ass crane to try to like pull it off there, unscrew it all, or awesome. chip it all out, or something like that. It's, yeah, it's just yeah. difficult. Yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. All right. I think that might be it. Any other questions before we let everyone go for the day? We're one minute over, but uh, yeah, I guess that's about it. Thank you all that's for joining. Good. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, thank you for joining. Cheers. It's been good. All right. Um. Yeah, if anyone has any other questions.